convicted on a RICO statute, RICO racketeering uh, act, which is the uh, Racketeering Influence Corruption and Organization Act, which uh, actually consisted of a, a number of charges stemming from 1976 to 1981. They indicated that uh, they charged me with uh, six armored truck robberies, the liberation of a side of Chicago, uh, using illegally gained funds to finance camp for black children in Mississippi, to uh, send material aid to uh, freedom fighters of Zamu, and to finance public mass organization work, and to put a acupuncture clinic in Harlem were part of the so-called enterprise I was accused of financing with illegally gained funds. And what were you convicted of? of I was convicted charges? of every single charge in the indictment, which no. consists of nine charges. You, you mentioned some assistance to freedom fighters? Yes. Where? In Zimbabwe. What is the nature of that crime? What is the criminal content in offering assistance to freedom fighters? They allege, well, first of all, there is a uh, federal statute of uh, uh, neutrality act, the violation of the neutrality act, which is a part of the federal government's use to ban, uses to ban people from participating in foreign countries or governments that they do not approve of. And, uh, so at the time that Zanu was fighting for its liberation, it was considered a terrorist organization or terrorist formation by the United States government because, as you know, it supported the Rhodesian government, the white minority government. And, uh, and is Zanu the organization that Robert Mugabe headed? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And Zappu was headed by Nkomo. Joseph, yeah, Joseph Nkomo. Yeah. Uh, we supported the liberation across the board of the Zimbabwean people. Uh, we particularly had an interest in Zanu because Zanu showed an interest in our efforts to uh, uh, hand across Africa, black people here, and African people in Africa uh, working together around common interests. You keep saying we. Who's we? We, I consider part of the black liberation movement, national liberation movement, and anti-imperialist white people in America who felt that they had a specific role to overturn some of the imperialistic uh, nature of the United States government and to go to uh, oppressed nations and hand out, you know, and offer support and allies to, you know, to their government. So we felt that uh, together, working together, it was an important uh, example to United States citizens that black and white can work together around specific goals to help the end of oppression in certain countries. Mm. When were you arrested? I was arrested in February of 1986. Mm -hmm. What were the circumstances of that arrest? What were you doing? Were uh, you underground at the I time? Was, I was living clandestinely, living underground from 1982 to 1986. Mm -hmm. I was uh, hunted on the FBI 10 most wanted list, and the Interpol list, me and Sister Nahande Dibitu. Why were you uh, living clandestinely? I chose, what started that, that whole process? Uh, after 1982, 1981, there was a uh, attempted armored truck robbery in Nyack, New York. That armored truck robbery became a basis for the Joint Terrorist Task Force to target specific people involved in the Republic of New Africa, Black Liberation Movement, and uh, May 19th and other organizations to target them as a, a leaders of, of these organizations to be a part of a conspiracy. Fulani Sunni Ali, who was a member of the Republic of New Africa, was targeted as being part of the armored truck attempt in Nyack, New York. Based upon a history of being involved in the COINTELPRO uh, investigation, as you know, we did with mm -hmm. Dolph Perry in the 70s and uh, Geronimo Pratt's case and Asada's and Deruba Moore's case, 
uh, clearly I was aware that uh, the targeting of black nationalists by the FBI was a significant uh, issue to be concerned with. So uh, we made a choice that some of us should maintain a presence and some of us should be clandestine in order not to be entrapped into a counterintelligence program. So I uh, went under in 1982 in order not to be involved in that conspiracy. All right. Uh, I want to get back to that and how it evolved even to that stage, but I want to get out of the way the status of your appeal. You are appealing the conviction of all of those counts, all nine counts? Absolutely. And what, are the, what is the essence of that appeal so we'll understand that clearly? Uh, what we are facing here is a issue of whether or not the proofs of this case, the factual evidence in this case, supported the verdict. I was convicted of every army truck robbery, which I think consists of one in Pittsburgh, one in New Jersey, one in Inwood, New York, uh, one in two attempts in Connecticut, one army truck robbery in the Bronx, one army truck robbery in New York, New York, the death of three, two policemen, the death of a guard, and the the escape of Assad Shakur from the liberation of Assad Shakur from prison. Now, the evidence that the jury convicted me on was the fact that my name was listed as a visitor for Assad Shakur in New Jersey Clinton prison. The only other collaborating evidence other than my name due to uh, Honestly, put on a book in order to visit the side of Chicago. On the day of the breakout? No, not on the day of the breakout. On a number of days, I visited the side, as you know, as a part of being a part of her appeal process for the conviction in 76. I uh, visited Sada in Rackers Island uh, when she was arrested and out in uh, New Brunswick when she was shot out there and arrested after Zayd was killed in 1973. I have consistently been a part of her legal defense. Uh, I, I felt that the only other evidence that they produced to indicate that I had anything to do with Assad's liberation was the testimony of an informant. And this informer said that I was a part of the planning and the uh, execution of the operation of the liberation of the National Court. Let's understand that being part of a movement and in people fighting oppression, you must understand is that when they implemented this RICO racketeering act, the burden of proof generally is supposed to be on the government to prove you guilty or, you know, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In the RICO, they are allowed to offer hearsay evidence that is not collaborated by any other physical concrete evidence. So what you're fighting is what an informer says, and that's allowed to be given to the jury. And even if that informer has a lot to gain from his testimony, and there's no physical evidence to back up what that informer says. On that informer's testimony alone, he or she can go to the grand jury, and that grand jury, because of the, it's a RICO indictment and part of the congressional statutes, anybody can be indicted on a, on a charge. And that kind of evidence can be admitted in court. In state courts, you cannot have that kind of proof. You must have a much more solid base in order to, you know, uh, offer it as evidence here. So... This is a federal indictment. This was a federal indictment. So your appeal is on a federal level. It's on a federal level. Uh, there was 3,173 3, prints of value uh, lifted from crime scenes, from weapons, from safe houses. Of uh, those 3,173 prints, 34 of those prints were mine. All of those prints were on public distributed information such as uh, Honor New African Freedom Fighters Day in July 18, 1981, Stop the Klan leaflets. And pamphlets. And pamphlets, general pamphlets that we handed out that we used. Uh, one pinky print was on a, a leaflet around New African Freedom Fighters Day on July 18 that was publicly distributed 
that was found in a, a so-called safe house in East Orange, New Jersey. That connected me to everything that was in that house when there was no proof whatsoever that I was ever in that house. No eyewitness proof, no proof whatsoever that I was ever in that house. So they offered explosive evidence against me. They offered uh, uh, a, a machine gun, a, a James Cagney type machine gun that looked at like it was a, a collector's item. Never was connected to any act in, the, in, in any uh, uh, acts in the indictment. So all of the proofs in this case against me was hearsay and the second side of the proofs was that I politically believe that brothers and sisters involved in our liberation have a right to struggle in order to be free. And because I have been a part of that struggle all my life, I will not capitulate and distance myself from their right to struggle in order for me to be free. But I, I, I think that, that is an important part of the proof because in this country they say that you cannot have a political trial, that your trial must be a criminal trial based upon criminal and, and federal codes. And I'm saying that the conviction of me was not because they, any proof was given that I was ever in any crime scene or a part of really any illegal conspiracy, but because of my political beliefs and because of the witness put forward and the type of defense put forward clearly demonstrated that I supported self-determination and national liberation. And if the acts in these indictments were connected to uh, a struggle for self-determination, then it was my, my role and my, it was important for me and our movement to look at the, and credit it as if we can prove that it was a part of it. And so for that reason, the jury was able to make a political determination of my beliefs what as opposed to a criminal determination. What was, the, what was the ethnic composition of the jury? There were seven blacks, three Puerto Ricans, and two whites. Well, what can you say about that? I think that it is important to understand that um, it's a crying shame. <laughs> it's a crying shame. Let me ask you this. One would say now, you can't really say much now, you can't cry racism with that kind of a breakdown ethnically in the jury. And it therefore seems to follow that the evidence was pretty strong against you if that ethnic composition in the jury would still find you guilty. Absolutely. I think that that's the argument and that's the task that the appeal is going to confront. And that's the task that our movement must confront. Well, in digest form, tell me how you're going to argue that. Because the question is, is not whether or not the jury was found the evidence. It's what the charge to the jury was of what the evidence is. And in a RICO racketeering act, conspiracy, the language of conspiracy, the association of, or the association with, is enough to make the issue of a conspiracy real as opposed to the tangible act. So you're saying that all of these bank robberies and whatnot have been put under the canopy of a conspiracy? Absolutely. Like in South Africa, if someone from the ANC goes to a corner in, in Soweto or Johannesburg where people are hanging out drinking beer and a pool room, they go up on the corner Everyone on that corner, if they do not want to be associated with the terrorist ANC, will separate from the ANC member walking up on that corner. Okay. Okay? And if we in America, black people who live in the U.S. of A, see a revolutionary or see people who are fighting against injustice, and they come and they participate and we agree with them and we encourage them to fight on and we think that's good for the people and we think that's good to be against oppression and we associate and we feed and we eat and we hang out and we play basketball